Good morning. Welcome home to Trinity, a place of sharing the gospel and growing God's family. Uh, before we get into uh, today's service, we're going to take a few minutes and watch a video from Dan Whitty, our congregational president. Hello, I'm Dan Whitty. It's my distinct honor to serve as congregational chairman. Last weekend, the elected leaders of our congregation had our annual planning retreat. It may be hard to believe, but we have only two more years left of our long-range ministry plan entitled Vision 2020. To lead us on toward the completion of that vision, we reviewed last year's goals and then set new ones for 2019. Last year, we had eight congregational goals. First, we wanted our ministerial staff to visit with those who have joined Trinity this last year to encourage them to continue in spiritual growth. We actually didn't do this. As you know, both Pastor Benz and Mr. Blowert took calls to serve at other churches, so this goal was put on hold. Second, we were going to evaluate the recommendations from the Assimilation Task Force and do all that we can to help people feel at home here at Trinity. We started this, but this too was put on hold as we focused on immediate staffing needs. Oh, and yes, we don't like the term assimilation. We'll try to find a new name. Next, our goal was to increase group Bible study attendance by 20%. God blessed us because compared to this time last year, we actually have over 100% increase. We wanted to research and implement phases five and six of our technology plan. Phase five would be to upgrade the fellowship hall to allow for Bible class online. Phase six would be announcement screens throughout the ministry center. With Pastor Italiano being our only full-time staff person, this was pushed to this coming year. The fifth goal was to continue the development of the Stephen Ministry Program. Several more Stephen ministers have been trained. We now have a total of 11 Stephen ministers who have provided over 420 hours of support to members. That is truly something to praise God for. Next, we were going to appoint members to the Joint Trinity Zion Cooperation Committee. This committee is to coordinate and communicate joint ministries between our two churches. This was done, and this new committee has started meeting. Seventh, we were going to work with Illinois Lutheran Schools to address and support facility needs. Illinois Lutheran has started an initial study of the financial feasibility of building. And finally, we were going to evaluate security issues. We wanted to make sure that the property God has given us, as well as our family of believers, are protected. We started this process, and a task force is currently looking at how we can be more safe and secure. You've noticed that we didn't accomplish everything we wanted to. That's okay. Sometimes we have our plans and God shows us his plans. We will go where God leads. Last weekend, the elected leaders of our congregation set new congregational goals, which only if it is God's will, we will accomplish this next year. The first of these new goals is to establish an assimilation committee. Next, we want to increase group Bible study attendance by 20%. We will keep working with Illinois Lutheran Schools to address and support facility needs. An exciting thing for this year is a new software for managing church functions called Church Community Builder. We will train leaders and members and start using this powerful new software. Finally, we want to better reach out to younger generations, as well as those who have never had any experience with the church. But in order to do that, we have to first understand the unique challenges and opportunities that present themselves. And so, all the boards will read and discuss the book, Growing Young, a book written with practical steps to help churches reach the youngest generations. These are the goals that, God willing, we hope to achieve in 2019. Each ministry board has set their own goals as well. In the coming weeks, each board will be highlighted in the worship folder, showing who is on that board and what each board hopes to accomplish this year. When you see that in the worship folder, be sure to pray for these men and these ministries here at Trinity. Thank you for your time. May God bless us as we share the gospel and grow God's family.
Today we continue our series, What's the Big Idea? And today we see Jesus teaching us a big idea, that of being opposite or counter culture. Our opening hymn for today is hymn 397, Just As I Am Without One Prayer. May God bless you as you worship him this morning.
This morning we follow the order of service, the service of word and sacrament. It begins on page 26 in the front of the hymnal. Please stand for worship. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this, I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. For all that we need in life and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy, Hear our prayer, O Lord. For the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love, and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil, hear our prayer, O Christ. For the well-being of your holy church in all the world, and for those who offer here their worship and praise, hear our prayer, O Lord. Merciful God, maker and preserver of life, uphold us by your power and keep us in your tender care. The works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise. Let us pray. Lord God, in mercy, receive the prayers of your people. Grant us wisdom to know the things that please you and grant us grace and power always to accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. Our first scripture reading for today is from the Apostle Paul's second letter to the Corinthian church, chapter 12, uh, verses 7 through 10 here. And this is a, 
rather interesting section. The Apostle Paul here talks about some problem, some issue that he had, and, and he doesn't really tell us what it was. He describes it as a thorn in the flesh, something that, that got in the way, something he felt hindered him. And yet God, oh, as Paul says here, actually used it. This is what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12. To keep me from being, becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a um, thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times, I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardship, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I'm strong. This is the word of our Lord. Alleluia. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. The gospel for today is in Luke chapter 6, verses 17 through 26, and this will also be the sermon text for today. He went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there, and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem, and from the coast of Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by evil spirits were cured, and the people all tried to touch him because power was coming out from him and healing them all. Looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven. For that is how their fathers treated the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for that is how their fathers treated the false prophets. This is the word of our Lord. Please be seated for our next hymn.
my brothers and sisters in Christ, we all understand, certainly the adults understand, the power, the, the, the pull of peer pressure, the, the, the pull to, to go along with the crowd. You know, peer pressure sometimes can be a good thing, and sometimes it can be bad. That, that pull to comply, to, to go the way that everyone else is going, can be very powerful at times. Back in the 1950s, there was a psychologist, uh, Salman Ash, who conducted a rather simple study, but it, it showed that, that, that urge we all have to comply and to give in to peer pressure. What, what he did in this study is, is he had a, it's really quite simple, he had a sheet that had a line drawn on it. And then he brought in people and they looked at the line and then they were giving three other lines and they were to match which lines were the same length. Pretty basic. Except only one person in that group actually was um, being tested. All the others were in on it. And they were given instructions to actually lie about the answer. And then they saw how that one person reacted. Now take a look to a quick example of this. The experiment you'll be taking part in today involves the perception of lengths of lines. As you can see here, I have a number of cards, and on each card there are several lines. Your task is a very simple one. You're to look at the line on the left and determine which of the three lines on the right is equal to it in length. All right, we'll proceed in this order. You'll give your answer. Only one of the people in the group is a real subject, the fifth person with the white t-shirt. The others are confederates of the experimenter and have been told to give wrong answers on some of the trials. The experiment begins uneventfully as subjects give their judgments. Two, 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 two. Three. 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 But on the third trial, something happens. Two. 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 Uh, two. The subject denies the evidence of his own eyes and yields to group influence. See, that, that, that's the power, isn't it? If everyone goes one way, even though the person may know they're wrong, because everyone's doing that, the, the, the urge is, is to comply, to, to go with the crowd. Now, it's interesting that this very study has been repeated again and again many different ways, and, and some, some um, reality or comedy TV shows have actually done it, but in an elevator, where everyone in the elevator is facing the back wall. And the one person that does not in on it, facing the door, where we normally face, ends up turning around, facing the back wall, because that's what everyone else does. Just recently, the same thing was done with a child and a row of robots. Because the robots all gave one answer, even though the child knew it was wrong, the child went along with the robots. See, that, that is the, the, the power of peer pressure to comply and, and go with the crowd. Well, today we see Jesus saying, no, that's not good. Today we see Jesus going against culture, against society. He is going counter culture. And we're going to look at the gospel reading for today, Luke chapter 6. Our, our gospel reading began this way. Jesus, he, he went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there and, and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem and from the coastal region around Tyre and Sidon who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by impure spirits were cured and, and the people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and, and healing them all. Looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Now, in this section, we're going to hear that word blessed 
quite a lot of times. In fact, this is often called the Beatitudes. Uh, Beatitudes comes from a Latin word which means blessed. So, what does blessed mean? Blessed means this. You've received divine favor. You receive favor from God. Now here's the thing about these uh, beatitudes, these blessings we're going to look at. It is really easy to misunderstand what they say. Jesus said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Okay, that does not mean if you're poor, you're going to heaven. And if you have money, if you're rich, you're not going to heaven. That's not what Jesus is saying here. So one of the tricks, a really important thing, of understanding the Bible is, is what's called let in Scripture interpret Scripture. You look at other parts in the Bible that talk about the same thing, and that helps you understand it. Well, our Scripture text here, our, our readings, is from Luke. This is a biography of Jesus written by Luke. We will call it a gospel. There are three other biographies, three other Gospels. And in one of them, Matthew, it records Jesus saying these blessings, these beatitudes. And this is what Matthew says. Blessed are the poor in spirit. And right there is the key for us today. That little two-word phrase, in spirit. That helps us understand what it says in Luke chapter 6. In fact, I'm going to have you write this in, in your worship folder in the blank there, okay? Jesus said, blessed are you who are poor, but here's the key, in spirit. This is not physically being poor. This is spiritually. Okay, so but what does that mean? Well, what does it mean to be poor in spirit? Well, the original Greek word that's translated here, being poor, has the idea of of begging. You, you have nothing in yourself. You, you, you're really at, at the mercy of, of anyone else. Jesus says, blessed are you when you are poor, when, when you have nothing here, but spiritually you are at God's mercy. You're blessed. You receive divine favor because salvation is not here. Salvation comes from above. It's like the, the old hymn, Rock of Ages. It says, Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. Jesus continues. He says, Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Again, to help us understand what Jesus is saying, fill in that blank, right? Blessed are you who hunger now in spirit. The other biography of Jesus, Matthew, um, has Jesus saying, Blessed are you who hunger now for righteousness. So it's the idea of, of hungering, starving, if you will, for something outside of us. God's righteousness, which is not here, but it comes from God. Because we hunger for God's righteousness, we are blessed. We receive divine favor. We'll be satisfied in our spirit. Jesus continues, Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. So I think you get the idea, right? What's the fill in the blank? Blessed are you who weep now, you can say it with me, in spirit. So it's, it's the idea of... Um, that uh, the parable Jesus told about that tax collector who went to church, went to the temple, and he went off in the corner, he wouldn't even look up, and he beat his breast and said, Lord, have mercy on me, a, a, a sinner. Weeping in spirit. Last week we saw Peter doing that, basically, when he was face to face with, with God's power and holiness. He fell at Jesus' feet and said, get away from me, Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm a sinful human being. When we weep in spirit, when we weep over what we have done, over our sins, 
Jesus says, we're blessed. Martin Luther knew that very well. When he wrote the 95 Theses that started the Protestant Reformation, the first of those said that, that confession should be a, a daily, ongoing thing. When we confess, when we weep over our sins, we will laugh. I love this painting. I, I love this. This is a, a painting by a person named Carolus Swaft. He's a painter in Cairo, Egypt. Some people say this is a, a great depiction of the first day in heaven. You can see how, how just tightly she is holding on to Jesus and how she is laughing. Because when we weep over our sins, we will laugh. Laugh not over what we've done, but over what Jesus has done. That he, that he died for our sins. That he rose from the dead. That he went into heaven to get it ready for us. And so when he takes us there, we will laugh with joy over what he has done for us. Jesus continues. Blessed are you when people hate you when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy because great is your reward in heaven for that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. So this fill in the blank is different from the others. Jesus said, blessed are you when people hate you. Okay, that's not exactly encouraging, is it? <laughs> That people will hate us, that they'll call us names, they will exclude us all because of Jesus? Um, remember what Jesus said. Blessed we are when this happens. Receiving divine favor. Jesus said in Matthew, when this type of thing happens, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you'll be given what to say. For it will not be you speaking, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Some of you know exactly what this is like because you've told me that this has happened to you. You don't know what to say, but somehow something comes out of your mouth and it, it's God giving you what to say at that very moment. Jesus, he's not being all gloom and doom here. He's just being realistic. You know, life is messy. Life is, um, is hard. For your students, maybe you haven't really experienced this, but you will. Your first job, maybe when you go off to college. Jesus says, when this happens, you will receive help. He'll give you the words. And most of all, great is your reward in heaven. Our first scripture reading today, the Apostle Paul talked about this thorn in the flesh. It kept him humble, and God used it. So here, Jesus gives four examples of how we are blessed, how we receive divine favor from him. Then, in the next few verses, Jesus contrasts that. Instead of blessings, he talks about woes. He said, but woe to you who are rich, for you've already received your comfort. Okay, so what does woe mean? You know, if, if blessings are receiving divine favor, what is woe? Woe is pretty much the opposite. Woe means sorrow and distress. And so Jesus says, woe to you who are rich. And again, what's the phrase we need to add to understand this correctly? In spirit. Woe to you who are rich in spirit. 
The idea of being full of yourself, of condescending on other people, looking down on them, full of yourself and what you have done and your deeds. Jesus says, woe to you. Because um, you may have comfort now, but that's a temporary thing. It will not be that way in eternity. Next, Jesus says, Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Again, it says fill in the blank. You know what it is, right? Jesus tells, says, Woe to you who are well fed now in spirit. It's kind of the same idea what Jesus just said. Whoever is satisfied with themselves, who has no room for God in their lives, no need for Jesus, spiritually, they are they're full of themselves, and they will realize they're wrong. It'll be too late. Jesus continues. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. And this fill in the blank is different from the others, okay? Woe to you who laugh now in spirit. I'm sorry, it is the same. Laughing at others. For their faith in Jesus, that this bad news. Pastor, the person may laugh now, but in eternity, they'll be weeping. They'll be grinding, gnashing of teeth. And finally, Jesus said, "Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how the ancestors treated the false prophets." And this fill in the blank is different. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you. If all a person does is care about what others think, their, their view, their outlook is, is very earthly focused. See, it is so easy that with every temptation, we, we look at the immediate, not, not the bigger picture, not certainly the eternal picture. That's really what every temptation is. That's really what every addiction does. It, it keeps us focused on the immediate. A, a person caught in the addiction of, of pornography is only focused on the immediate, not, not thinking about those women, the, the, the daughters, the sisters, the mothers, and the guilt and the shame. A person who gets in a car after drinking too much is not thinking about the other people on the road. A student who who steals answers is not thinking about failing or being expelled. A spouse with wandering affection is not thinking about children or years invested in that marriage. Every temptation is narrow focus on the immediate and not on the bigger picture. So what is the big picture? What's the big idea that Jesus is telling us here? He's, he's counterculture. So what's the big idea? It's this. Culture tells us what you have and who you are is important, right? What you have. Possessions, money, position, um, the things you have in the garage, those are, are what's important. That, that's what our society tells us. It also says that who you are is important, the position you have, the higher up, the, the more important it is. But Jesus is counterculture. So Jesus tells us this, who you have and what you are that was really important. Who you have? You have Jesus. That's the most important thing. He came to save us, not to show us how to save ourselves. He came to save us. Who we have is Him. And so what we are is we are, we're God's child, a redeemed, forgiven child of God, loving, sharing fighting to, to see the, 
not the small picture, but the big eternal picture. Fighting to not go with the crowd, but to go against them. Fighting to, to show and share God's love. That is um, completely counter opposite our culture, isn't it? And that brings us to why Jesus is a big deal. Because he is counterculture. Not going with the easy path of complying and going with the crowd, but, but just the opposite. My friends, that's why he's a big deal. Because we are blessed now and in the future when we are also counter culture. My friends, may we be blessed. Amen. Please stand. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, which transcends our understanding, guide and guard your hearts and minds unto life eternal. Amen. Let's join together in the Nicene Creed. It's on page 31 in the front of the hymn. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated as we bring our offerings to honor our Lord.
Turning our hymnals to page 32, we join in the responsive prayer of the church. Please stand for that prayer. Gracious God and Father, we praise you for the countless blessings which we receive from your hand, the beauties of creation and the bounties of the earth, the joy of life and the pleasure of friendship, the good of work and the gift of rest, the privilege to share happiness and sorrow with one another. Above all, we praise and thank you for your saving word and for your son's body and blood which you give us to eat and to drink in the sacrament. Through these means of grace, you send the Holy Spirit into our hearts and unite us to Jesus and to the whole Christian church on earth. Great God and Lord, without your continuing help, we easily waver in our faith, lose courage, and grow careless in our watchfulness. The times and days are perilous. Give us strength to face the evils of each day with fresh confidence. Open our lips to speak of your grace, and move us to use the gifts that you give us to share your word of salvation with all people. Protect and prosper the family, the school, the government, and all good institutions that you have established for the benefit of society. Remember in mercy those who are sick and suffering, and bring your healing to troubled homes and lives. Lord, we join Shelley Thompson in thanking you for a successful surgery this last week, and now we ask you to continue blessing her with a good recovery after her surgery. Hear us now, Lord, as we bring you our own private petitions. Now, eternal God and Father, keep us in the saving faith and so enable us to overcome all things through our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we join in praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love, he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. In the past, he spoke to us through the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, who is the radiance of his glory. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever. Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, 
gave thanks and gave it to them saying, take and drink. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Please be seated.
Opening our hymnals to page 36, let us join together in singing the song of thanksgiving. Please stand for that song. Hear the prayer of your people, O Lord, that the lips which have praised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you his peace. Please be seated for our closing hymn.
Good morning again. Uh, just two announcements I want to highlight from the worship folder. This afternoon, two things are going on. Two o'clock, Illinois Lutheran School bands have their concert. It'll be at the high school campus in the gym there. And then this afternoon at four o'clock, our junior high youth group, Fish, will have an outing as well. Have a blessed day. The experiment you'll be taking part in today involves the perception of lengths of lines as you can...